Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Abe, one of the student ministers here, and let me add my welcome to Chester's. It's so great that you could be here at church today, especially so if you're here for the first time. What a wonderful opportunity it is for you to come here and meet the living God. Once upon a time, there was a man on a vessel sailing across the sea. This man was a prophet of God, and he was very tired. The waves gently rocked the vessel, and soon the prophet was fast asleep. Suddenly, a raging storm hit the sea. The wind was furious. The waves swept over the vessel, and it began to fill with water. Somehow, the sleeping prophet continued to sleep through the chaos. The crew, who, despite all being veteran sailors, began to panic. They shook the prophet and said to him, waking him up, we're going to die. Don't you care if we drown? The prophet, rising from his sleep, stood up and said, quiet, be still. The wind died down as quickly as it came. The waves ceased their raging and there was complete calm. The sailors were terrified. Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, this prophet was not Jonah, but Jesus. The names are different, but the parallels are remarkable. Both are prophets of God. Both of them are in vessels that are on the water. A mighty storm comes upon both of them. Both were asleep and seemingly oblivious from the danger. Both storms ceased miraculously. Both stories end with the other sailors being terrified and fearing the Lord. Now, the parallels between Jonah and Jesus, they don't end there. In fact, Jesus explicitly compares himself to Jonah. So we see that Jonah is a type of Jesus, someone in history who points to Jesus. Jesus, uh, Jesus will be similar to Jonah, where Jonah does well, and Jesus will be different to Jonah, where Jonah does badly. Jonah is a type of the Lord Jesus, and so when we look at his story, we, we will learn something about Jesus Christ. But there's more. For not only does Jonah imperfectly represent Christ, he also rather perfectly represents me and you. And you, and you, and you. Because Jonah is the stereotypical figure who runs away from God. Jonah represents the, the non-Christian who runs away from God and who refuses to believe the gospel and to submit to Jesus. But Jonah also represents the normal everyday Christian. And we'll see how today. So let me pray that God would use Jonah to teach us about what sort of a God he is and what he does with people who run away. Father in heaven, let your spirit open our eyes and touch our hearts so that we become afraid of running away from you and instead turn to Jesus for forgiveness and purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I've got four headings today. Four headings. Number one, disobedience. Number two, disaster. Number three, despair. And number four, death and deliverance. Uh, death and deliverance together, I've decided to have four rather than five headings because the last two are so tightly connected, they really form one twin heading. So firstly, disobedience. Running away from God begins with disobedience. Verses one and two. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, when God speaks, we obey. He is creator, we are created. He is master, we are servants. What should Jonah's response be? There's only one answer. He should do what God says. God says do this, and, and we should do it. But instead of obeying, verse 3, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarshish to flee from the Lord. God had told Jonah to go to Nineveh, 
Now, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, the superpower of the time. And we're not told yet why Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. That comes in chapter 4. But for now, it's enough to know that Assyria was Israel's number one enemy. Now, Israel was here. Nineveh was here to the east. And Tarshish, as far as we can tell, is in what, is now we call, what we now call Spain, way over here in the west. All right? So Israel, Nineveh, Tarshish. God says, go this way, and Jonah goes that way. That's what sin is. God says, do this, and I do the opposite. God says, don't say that hurtful thing. I say that hurtful thing. God says, go help your wife. I sit on my butt and do nothing. God says, don't look at that thing on the internet. I look at that thing on the internet. God says, read my word and talk to me in prayer. I think I've got better things to do. I'm Jonah. And you're Jonah. Not only is Jonah disobeying God's command, he's actively fleeing from God's presence. He's running away from God. Now, I doubt that Jonah truly believes he can run away from God. It's true that sin clouds our judgment and makes us think and do stupid things. But Jonah definitely knows that God is the creator of heaven and earth. He knows God is not geographically tied to the land of Israel. Jonah doesn't truly think that by leaving Israel, he can leave God behind. But what Jonah is doing is to flee the felt presence of the Lord. The felt presence of the Lord. As long as he's in Israel, where God's talked about, and Jonah's known as a prophet, he'll be reminded of God. He knows he can't get to any place where God is not there, but maybe he can get to a place where he can forget about God, where he won't be constantly reminded of his disobedience. And don't we relate to that? I certainly do. The sin that I committed yesterday, that temptation I gave into, I feel guilty and, and I don't want to be reminded of it. So maybe today I won't read God's word. Or maybe I won't pray or talk about God to my friends and family. Maybe I won't go to church today and be reminded that my relationship with God is not right. Or maybe I've avoided church once or twice, so I don't want to go anymore because people might, might remind me I was missing for a few weeks. Now, we don't seriously believe we can go somewhere where God is not. But at least we can do things to avoid feeling like he is, feeling like he's near us. We can avoid being reminded that he's everywhere. We can, we can flee God's felt presence. Jonah is fleeing God's felt presence. And interestingly, as he flees, things seem to go his way. He goes to, to Joppa, a port city on the coast. And when he arrives in Joppa, it just so happens that there's a ship that will take him. And it just so happens that it'll take him as far away from Nineveh as possible. What are the chances? Jonah might even feel that the door is open for him to pursue a different path, maybe even mission to Spain. Well, let this be a lesson to us. Circumstance is never a good guide if we disobey God's word. Now, unless your, your life is completely surrendered to God and his written word, never allow an opportunity to guide you. Now, the devil can, oppor can op open opportunities for you too. God says to serve him and not money. For no man can serve two masters. But this incredible job opportunity has come up. Sure, it means I now have to work overtime and on weekends, and meaning that I, I won't have time to serve the Lord during the week or spend time with my kids or I'll be exhausted on Sunday so I can't engage with church. But... This job opportunity is so rare. Why would God give me this opportunity if he doesn't want me to take it? Maybe God wants me to earn loads of money and tithe some of it to church. It feels so right to take this job. But guidance from God's word trumps all inner feelings or outward circumstances. If you're currently running from God, return to his written word, the Bible, don't trust your inner feelings or your outward circumstances. So Jonah's running away from God, and it is a downward spiral. Literally, Jonah keeps going downwards. Verse 3, Jonah went 
down to Joppa. And then he found a ship and went aboard the ship. The Hebrew for went aboard is literally went down into the ship. And in verse 5, we see that Jonah had then gone below the deck. Now, again, that the Hebrew for went below deck is again literally went down into the inner part of the ship where he fell fast asleep. Down, down, down. Of course, Jonah is physically asleep, but more importantly, this symbolizes that he is spiritually asleep. He's no longer spiritually capable of recognizing danger. His downward spiral of rebellion leads to spiritual slumber. And once again, isn't this true of us? When we disobey God, and instead of repenting, we keep turning away from Him and running away, it becomes a downward spiral. Our once-off sin, if not repented of, can become a pattern of sin that gets so difficult to break out of. And when you've given into temptation once, it becomes so much easier to give in again. And the guilt that occurs when we run away from God can drive us further and further away. Satan accuses us and tells us lies that God doesn't love us because we're sinful. Now, someone I knew very closely thought their sins were unforgivable and that they were going to hell anyway. And so they just gave into all sorts of more serious sin. Thankfully, God in his kindness didn't let this person get away, but pursued them until they turned around and embraced his grace, mercy, and lordship. Much like Jonah's story, actually. But nonetheless, our initial disobedience often leads to fleeing God's felt presence. And the more we avoid God, the worse our spiritual condition becomes. It's a downward spiral until we reach a state of spiritual slumber. Unaware of just how much danger we're in, we're unable to wake up. Which leads us to the second heading, disaster. A disaster is God's way of waking us up. Verse 4, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Now the sailors, seasoned and experienced, are so afraid they, they hurl their precious cargo overboard to increase their chances of survival. The captain knows that throwing cargo overboard will probably bankrupt him, but it's that or die. It's a desperate situation. Jonah can't escape God. God will pursue him in a storm if he has to. Disobedience leads to disaster. Either discipline, if you'll repent... Or destruction if you won't. Now, if you're trusting in Jesus when you turn from God and he pursues you with disaster, he does so out of love that you might repent and turn back to him. The disaster is discipline. But if you're not trusting in Jesus and you keep running from God, the disaster will end in your final and eternal destruction. Now, even if you think your life on this earth is smooth sailing the whole way, after death there is the implacable storm of God's judgment and everlasting destruction. Now, the storm, the storm is raging all around Jonah. Notice that the sailors, who are innocent in this matter, are caught up in the consequences. They're innocent bystanders to Jonah's conflict with God, but they're affected as well. Now, sin is never private. Its consequences affect others who are innocent. And that's because the human race is connected. Our actions can hurt others, even those who are innocent. The child born to an absent father is innocent, but shares in the consequences. Now, one drunk driver can destroy the lives of many innocent people. Adam and Eve's original sin brought death to the whole human race. And in the book of Joshua, the sin of one soldier in stealing gold from God brings defeat to the whole army of Israel. Our individual sin, we might think it's private, it affects the growth and fruitfulness of the whole church. <clears throat> and these sailors, innocent as they are, are caught up in Jonah's sin. Disaster has come upon Jonah because of his disobedience. The captain wakes the sleeping Jonah up in verse 6. How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us that we will not perish. Now, the captain and the other sailors are pagans. They all have their own gods, and the captain refers to God as Jonah's God. And although they don't know God, 
they know he has power and they ask Jonah to intercede for them. Jonah is beginning to realize his situation. He's been, he's been woken up by disaster from his obliviousness. And he knows it's his fault. And there's a striking similarity between what the captain says to Jonah now and what God said to Jonah in the beginning. You can't really see it in, in the translation we use, but actually, in verse 2, a literal translation of what God says is, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. Arise and call out. And now in verse 6, again, a literal translation of what the captain says is, Arise and call out to your God. Arise and call out. In the original Hebrew, this arise and call out pattern is unmistakable. And I'm sure Jonah recognized God's voice echoing in the captain's words. It confirms to him that this disaster has happened because he first neglected God's voice. In verse 7, the sailors cast lots because in those days they believed that nothing happens by chance. And the lot falls on Jonah. Now everyone knows it's his fault. Verse 8, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? You you can hear the desperation in their voices. Tell us why. Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Disaster has come. It's Jonah's fault. He knows it. Everyone knows it. How will he respond? And Jonah responds with despair. Our third heading, despair. Instead of repentance and prayer, Jonah despairs. That's it. I'm useless now, he thinks. Verse 9, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah tells the sailors that he's a Hebrew, answering their questions about where he's from, his country, and his people. Now notice what he doesn't answer. He doesn't answer their question about his occupation. Jonah was a prophet of the Lord, but he doesn't say it. Perhaps he's too ashamed to say it. Perhaps he thinks that he's not a prophet anymore. In any case, he can't bring himself to say it. Sin renders him ashamed and useless in the moment of crisis. Jonah's disobedience means he is unable even to call himself a prophet. And aren't we like that as well? After we disobey God, often we're too ashamed to call ourselves Christians. And the devil certainly tries to make us too ashamed to call upon God again. That downward spiral of disobedience into shame, common Christian experience. What have you done? cry the sailors. In verse 5, the storm first came, they were afraid. Now in verse 10, they are terrified, literally exceedingly afraid. This is no natural storm, this is supernatural. And they have on their ship someone who has deliberately fled from the almighty God who controls the sea. What shall we do to you, they ask Jonah. Now even at this point, it's not too late for Jonah to repent. He could have prayed but he doesn't. He could have called out to God like the captain asked him to, but he doesn't. He could have told God, I'll do what you say. I'll go to Nineveh. Just spare these innocent sailors. But he doesn't. Whether it's his pride that prevents him from repenting or shame and despair that makes him think it's over, the only way out that he sees is his death. Verse 12, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. This is the end, Jonah thinks. Nothing left but for me to die. And Jonah's not being heroic. This is all his fault. And it is striking that Jonah doesn't pray at all. And at no point is there a hint of remorse or repentance. Nor does God actually say, yep, Jonah has to get thrown in. Jonah just assumes that's the solution. Jonah knows it's his fault. And his conclusion is that there's nothing left for him but to die. It's not heroism that's driving his thinking, it's despair. Surprisingly, the sailors don't immediately do what he says. They're desperate, but they're still acting nobly. 
They try their best to, to row back to dry land. They don't want to throw Jonah overboard, even though it's his fault. Remember that Jonah is a Hebrew prophet, and the book of Jonah was written to the Hebrew people, the people of God. And yet in this story, it's the pagans who are the heroes, and the prophet of God who's the villain. And that's what happens when we as Christians run away from God. The non-believers all around can put us to shame with their outwardly better behavior. The sailors try their best to save both their own lives and Jonah's life, but it's hopeless. In fact, verse 13, the sea grows wilder than before. There's nothing for it but to throw Jonah into the sea. And unlike Jonah, who doesn't pray, the pagan sailors actually pray to the living Lord. Verse 14, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. And with that, they hurl Jonah into the sea. And the sea ceases from its raging. Now, isn't that remarkable? The death of the prophet brings deliverance for everyone else. The death of the prophet brings deliverance for everyone else. Death and deliverance, our final point. The inevitable end of disobedience without repentance is death. Jonah refuses to repent, and so he has to die. Into the sea he goes. But even there, God's not done with Jonah. Verse 17, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And many people dismiss the story of Jonah as make-believe because of the great fish. Seems ridiculous. But the whole point of the fish is that it's miraculous and and unexpected. It's a miraculous and unexpected salvation. This doesn't usually happen. A person thrown overboard in a storm usually drowns. A person swallowed by a big fish or a a whale is usually crushed or suffocated. None of this is usual. Everything about this is unusual. But if God is truly the creator of the world and is active in it, then there's no real reason why he cannot save Jonah in this way. And he did. Jonah is unrepentant, and so into the sea and into the fish he goes. This is a death-like experience. And Jonah himself describes it in chapter 2 with such vivid terms that some commentators believe he actually died and came back to life. Whatever the case, what happens to Jonah clearly symbolizes death. And that's the end for all of us if we do not return to God. Running away from God leads to death. Be warned, running away from God leads to death. But this death is not significant for Jonah alone. This death brings deliverance to the sailors. The storm is stopped by the death of the prophet. And this leads in verse 16 to the sailors fearing the one true God, offering sacrifices to him and making vows. It's like they're converted and saved spiritually as well as physically. And we began with a story about Jesus sleeping in a storm before waking up and stilling it. Jonah is a type of Jesus. So let's go back and look at the ways Jonah has paralleled or contrasted Jesus in this chapter. God sends Jonah to the enemies of God's people, the Ninevites. Jonah says not. God sends Jesus to the enemies of God, sinful humanity, And Jesus says, yes. Now, because of Jonah's sin, he's asleep and and unaware amidst the storm. Because Jesus is in control, he's asleep and at, at peace amidst the storm. The storm is stilled by the symbolic death of Jonah, and the innocent sailors are rescued. But when it comes to Jesus, he stills the storm with a word. Now, the parallel seems to break. But that's because in Jesus' case, there's another storm that continues the parallel, and that is the storm of God's righteous judgment against sinful humanity. In Jonah's case, the storm is God's judgment against his own sin. In Jesus' case, the storm is God's judgment against sinful humanity. In Jonah's case, the sailors are innocent bystanders, and Jonah is the guilty one. 
In Jesus' case, the store, uh, sorry, in Jesus' case, the, the roles are flipped. The sailors, that is us humans, are guilty, and Jesus is the innocent one. In Jonah's case, the storm of God's judgment is calmed when Jonah symbolically dies. In Jesus' case, the storm of God's judgment is calmed by Jesus' death on the cross. This second storm cannot be calmed by a word because justice must be done. In Jonah's case, the guilty one dies and the innocent ones are delivered. In Jesus' case, the innocent one dies and the guilty ones are delivered. Death and deliverance. This is the gospel. All of us, like Jonah, have run away from God and are on a downward spiral to death and hell. Destruction is what we deserve. So when you hear me say the whole time that you're Jonah and that you need to stop running from God, it can be all too easy for you to think that you are able to stop and that God would just receive you back because he's nice. But the problem of sin is much bigger than that. We can't just say we're sorry and expect God to sweep our sin under the carpet. Where would justice be? No, given the natural course of God's justice, once we disobey, we are on that inevitable downward spiral to eternal destruction. God's justice must be satisfied, and our disobedience must be punished. Once we start running from God, we must perish in the storm. And yet, and yet we are able to stop running. And we ask God to forgive our disobedience. God does forgive us and receives us with open arms. When we repent, God saves us from the storm. How is that possible? It is because Jesus, the perfect Jonah, has jumped into the storm on our behalf. Jesus, the Son of God, himself fully God and one with the Father, has died on the cross in our place. On the cross, our disobedience has been punished. The payment paid, God's righteous justice satisfied. And forgiveness is available to all who will receive it by faith. And so whoever you are, whether you're a non-believer or a Christian, if you are running away from God in any aspect of your life, turn back. Don't be like Jonah, but repent. God has promised to forgive you and to receive you because Jesus has already died in your place. Do not run from this this offer of forgiveness. Do not run from his offer of forgiveness. Do not refuse God a second time. Let me pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the death of Jesus that brings deliverance to us if we believe. Help us to stop running away from you. Help us to repent and give us assurance that we are forgiven because of Jesus. In his name, amen.